Hey, how about a quick follow-up to this fly cutter build? I got quite a few questions and fast made me realize maybe just how much I took for granted. We're having some bad weather, heavy wind and rain, so if you hear a lot of strange noises down here, my apologies in advance. A popular comment seemed to imply a certain fear of fly cutters, and if potentially they're dangerous, holding power of the tool, out of balance because of the geometry, etc. I don't know what it's worth, but personally I've been using these types of cutters for a long time, and I don't know if it's any more dangerous than any other tooling in the mill. You know, in a pinch, I've welded 16-inch boring bars from the lathe onto drill chucks. Just be careful, and if you don't feel comfortable with a certain piece of tooling or an operation, you find another way to do it. That said, the fly cutter is, by nature, an unbalanced tool. I mean, I've seen some fly cutter designs that go to some pains to balance the tool. Like, for example, you can see it's thin on one side and thicker on the cutting side. And you'll sometimes see a scallop taken out of this leading edge. You can work that out in CAD. Just keep cutting away material on the big side until you move the center of gravity in line with your spindle. But really all that would achieve is a static balancing. Once you fire this thing up, it obviously is not balanced. But just like anything else, you'll want to keep a fly cutter or any tooling suited to the size of your machine. My mill happens to be quite stout and heavy, so this amount of imbalance really doesn't make a difference. You could maybe split hairs and try to find defects in surface finish, maybe caused by this out of balance, but the reality is that a slight change in feed rate or a nose radius or rake might fix that surface finish problem. In terms of tool retention, it's just a combination of a good fit between the high-speed steel in the slot and the three set screws. It's nothing more than friction. There's no undercuts, no dimples, no ribs holding that in place. It's really only friction. But when you think about it, I mean, that's all that's keeping you and your car on the road. If, however, you don't like this style of fly cutter, there is a different style that's essentially like a fixed diameter. So again, here's the piece of chrome chaffing. Imagine this had an arbor that went in your mill, and you'll see some that just have holes drilled, maybe at different radii. I think I've only ever seen them on the perimeter. And you install a tool, maybe like a broken high-speed steel bit or a carbide end mill that's been resharpened with a set screw in the side, and that might not be as intimidating as a classic fly cutter. You can't adjust this, but if you make one large enough for the type of work that you do, you know, 80% of the sizes you work on, your bases might be covered. That said, you can also use boring heads as fly cutters. Depending on the size of your boring head, you might not have as much adjustment as a traditional fly cutter, but it would certainly work essentially identical. In my boring head, I put the bar out the side just to show you that you can get the larger diameters. This, of course, was designed for boring. The cutting tool actually is higher than the bottom of the boring head, so I couldn't use this for facing. But maybe you have a, you know, a special tool that you could use in your boring head for surfacing parts when you need it. Another good point that came up that I failed to address in the last two videos is the tram of the milling machine. There is no worse way to find out your mill is out of tram than during a finishing cut with a fly cutter. If your head is just slightly out, especially if you have the high-speed steel bit out to a very large radius, as you cut over your part, you'll see from the surface finish that the head might not be as trammed as you thought. I think I talk a bit about head tram in the squaring the block video. Another good comment that was made is regarding using indexable tooling or carbide in your fly cutters. And that's absolutely true. There's no reason you need to use high speed steel. You certainly can use a turning tool or a boring bar of the right size for your fly cutter and get your surface speeds up into the carbide range. In this particular case, I would need a left-hand turning tool because of the, the way the geometry of my fly cutter head is. If I were to install this with the cutting tip down, this would want to be spun backwards, but the cutting edge is now on the wrong side of the center line. If I flip that, you know, the insert's in the wrong direction. But if you had the right indexable tooling to fit your fly cutter, then yes, it's totally fine. In fact, in some cases, it might be advantageous to switch to carbide. About the junk tool holder, some of you guessed it, the problem is actually the ISO taper. 
So here I blued it and I pulled it up into the spindle and you can see it makes contact on two opposing sides. This one's harder to see, but there you can see where it's really kind of drawn up against the edge of the taper. Had I turned this cylindrical in that particular instance, it would have been perfectly cylindrical with the spindle axis. But the next time I took this out and reinstalled it, it would have been in some other position completely. It just, the whole thing is a piece of junk. My indexable end mills also piqued some interest in the comments section. These are the three indexable inserts that I have, not counting the larger face mill. You can get a better look at these in the tool holders video, where I actually built the tool holders specifically for these three indexable end mills. These are Char's indexable end mills. For what I do, I've found the quality to be in line with the price point. Let's put it that way. I've got a 3 8 a half inch, and a three quarter. The three eighths and the half inch are both single insert, and the three quarters is a three insert indexable end mill. I've really gotten to like these as sort of my roughers. The inserts are a lot cheaper than, you know, burning out a lot of, for example, small three eighths inch end mills. But I'll use these as my roughers and then save my high speed steel or carbide proper end mills for the finish cut. In this case, this end mill took the slot to size after the smaller one roughed it out. While I'm here, I'd like to thank the viewers that corrected me on the burnt up coil issue. I implied in the video that somehow the load on the spindle, or how hard I was pushing my machine, contributed maybe to the death of this coil. It makes sense that this coil is only just the activation signal and isn't carrying the actual current of the spindle motor. And I'd just like everyone to know that I've sat down with my staff of writers and producers and chided them severely. I haven't actually looked around for this yet. Ideally, I'd like to find the same one. I do realize I could change the whole contactor out, but I'd like to find the same one just for ease of installation. I'll give you a look inside the control panel of the milling machine. I don't think there are standard DIN rails there to pop in a new contactor, so I'd have to relocate it to some other position. There's like a million wires that go to this thing and they're all the same color, so I figured I could avoid a lot of heartache by just replacing just the coil. But it sounds like the odds of finding this might be slim, so that's probably what I'll have to do. So since I opened the feeds and speeds can of worms, I thought maybe it'd be appropriate to calculate them for a fly cutter and actually try cutting some steel. Now on the lathe, I mentioned the magic number for carbide against steel is about seven, eight, nine hundred feet per minute. For high-speed steel, that number comes down to about 100. Again, there's wiggle room in those numbers, but ballpark, if you've got high-speed steel against steel, shoot for about 100 surface feet per minute. If it's carbide, you're an order of magnitude higher, almost 1,000. So here I've cut the blank down, and I've set it to about 2 inches. I don't know if you can see that, but that's about a 2-inch radius. So it's making a 4-inch diameter circle. A 4-inch diameter circle has a circumference of just about a foot. 12 inches. At 100 surface feet per minute target cutting speed, we'd want this to run at 100 RPM. 100 revolutions per minute times 1 foot per minute is 100 surface feet per minute. I haven't changed the grind. It's still the same cutting geometry we saw in the last video up against the aluminum. My feed rate, if I'm not mistaken, is about 1 inch per minute, 25 millimeters per minute. And just spitballing, I'll probably take, I don't know, a 20 thou depth of cut. Half a millimeter. Let's see how it goes. All right, so there it is. Not as spectacular as the aluminum cut. An inch per minute, I mean, man, that felt slow. Just by feel, I think I could bump the RPMs up a little bit higher. Probably also bump that feed rate. They're what the chips look like. They're dark color, probably more because of the oil than any heat that they might have picked up. 
but it's more of like a satin finish. It's nice and smooth, functional, but I'd have to do a little bit of experimenting with the grind on the tool and the speeds and the feeds to really bring up a nice surface finish. All right, so I hope that answered some of the questions. Sorry if I left some of that info out of the other two videos.